Hello. Welcome to the first installment of the Health Storytelling Author Series Q&A for the academic year 2022-2023. I'm Marin McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University. I'm the curator of this series, which makes me your host as we undertake our third full year of author conversations. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest for the first installment, journalist Rachel E. Gross and her amazing book, Vagina Obscura, An Anatomical Voyage. But first, I want to tell you about the whole series. At least once per month during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with society. This series of conversations is sponsored by the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health and co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, which is an affiliate of the Library of Congress. It is live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and archived on YouTube. The authors appearing in this season, fall 2022, are tonight, Rachel Gross, with Vagina Obscura, which is published by W.W. Norton, on October 27th, Jim Downs with Maladies of Empire, How Colonialism, Slavery, and War Transformed Medicine. That's published by an imprint of Harvard University Press. And on November 29th, Stephen Thrasher will speak to us about the viral underclass, the human toll when inequality and disease collide, which is published by an imprint of Macmillan. One final note, this is a live event. You can interact with us if you are watching this live and we encourage you to do that. If you want to ask a question, please comment on any of the platforms where you're watching us and our producer, Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social, will make sure we see what you've said. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this 60 minute live stream, but you can put your questions into the comment box at any time. Now. Let's turn to our book for tonight. Rachel Gross is a science journalist, formerly the digital science editor for Smithsonian Magazine, and also a former Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT. Her book, Vagina Obscura, came out in March, and I can't wait to talk to her about it. So Rachel, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me here, Marin. This is an honor. <laughs> I am very pleased to do this. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, I have written three books so far. I am flirting with the idea of a fourth, but I'm pretending not to. And what I most know from that experience is that people don't devote years of work to a book unless they're obsessed with a topic and feel like there's something about it that they uniquely can express. So I would really like to hear what made you write this book. What was it that you urgently needed to talk about? That's a great question. Um, I think about this sometimes. I have always liked talking about vaginas and uteruses and ovaries. I know, and it's hard to know when that started. I think I really enjoyed the shock factor. Um, like also my mom is a doctor, my dad is a scientist, so I, I love weird and wonky um, knowledge. I was like really interested when I got an IUD put in, I gave her a name, I kept the ultrasound and showed my mom as if it was my new womb occupant. Um, and I, I think that interplay of how people reacted to my like sense of curiosity and fun with these things was part of the tension that started me on this journey. Uh, so when I was at Smithsonian Magazine, um, I was the science editor and I, wrote and edited a lot about like reproductive science and animal sex. But at the same time, I was running this column called Unsung Women in the History of Science that was about women who didn't always have questions about their own bodies, but they were trying to push their field forward and ask new questions. And there were all these systemic ways in which you could see them getting pushed out. Um, and it became really clear to me that these mysteries we have about women's bodies and bodies with the kind of anatomy I was interested in was deeply related to the lack of 
women and other gender diverse people in science. So there was an intersection here about like who's asking the questions, um, what kind of bodies do we care about, and what kind of knowledge are we privileging? And, and that was the space I really wanted to explore in Vagina Obscura. So I am suddenly getting an image of you as a kid on the playground in like third grade, running around to tell all the other kids, did you know that we have vaginas? When everyone else is using some sort of kid terminology, I just find that delightful. I'm sorry if I've completely made that up. No, I I'm, I'm gonna enter that into my head canon. That's now how it was. I definitely didn't have any of those like terms that you're talking about. Like I didn't know any of them until I started writing this book. I was like mini, like, Front butt? I've never heard of these. This is probably the point at which I should tell you that um, for probably about a month now, probably since I started reading your book and talking about it in my house, um, Facebook started stalking me with ads about vulvas. Yep. More precisely, what I think is for an ad is an ad for a laser hair removal device for intimate areas. But the hook of the particular ad that I keep seeing, I assume because my phone was eavesdropping on me, is one in which the company that makes this device asked the people who were buying it what they call their intimate areas. And you can probably guess that they said that the responses they get back were not vagina and vulva. They were hoo-ha and downtown and Miss Kitty and the Duchess. And you get the idea. So... The, the thing that struck me about that as a society after I stopped laughing and also wanting to take a hammer to my phone was... I'm so sorry on my behalf for, for doing this to you. I feel like I have to think up something totally different that I'm now interested in and walk around my house saying it just so the ads will switch. But the, the cybersecurity is a completely separate topic which we are not here to talk about. So the thing that struck me about my experience the, of the, over the past month is that as a society, we have terrible trouble actually naming out loud the common taken for granted names for reproductive anatomy, particularly female reproductive anatomy. And here you are, you not only are going around talking about them, but you put them in a book and you put them on the cover. So I would love to hear a bit about that, like how you came up with the title how you decided that this was going to be your life's work for the next year or to the past year and the next year or two of saying these words out loud a lot and, and sort of what's what that that has been like for you and what what decisions you made in order to do this yeah it was definitely a journey with the title um I think we had some back and forth between my editors and me about like are people going to pick this up are they going to feel comfortable being on the subway and my whole thing was if they don't, they should. And somebody has to put out something that's really frank and in your face. And is not just saying the euphemism or has a picture of a flower or a piece of cut fruit or like an unzipping zipper, which is really common for these kind of books. Um, so interestingly, initially the name was Lady Anatomy. And that came from a an Italian anatomist, I think from the 18th century, who was called the Lady Anatomist. And she was really bold. She actually studied the male genitals and the eyeball. Um, and there was this play on like kind of Lady Liberty, like, and this sort of tongue of cheek, tongue in cheek, like lady doctor, lady scientist. Um, and what I quickly realized was we were not just talking about women and ladies and that that was really gonna limit the scope of the book. We were talking about all of this anatomy. So like vaginas, uteruses, vulvas, clitorises, ovaries. Um, and that's present in non-binary people, intersex people, trans people. Um, and really as the book went on, it became clear that I wanted to show how science had often grouped people according to this anatomy and labeled them as women. And that often had horrible consequences for them. Um, but really, if you get right down to it, there is like a decoupling of, of gender from this. Um, so basically, vagina does serve as this weird like synecdoche for the whole, even though it shouldn't. Um, so I was interested in having having that word um, for like basically the name recognition value. Um, but what I was really thinking of was a camera obscura. Hmm. So 
A camera obscura is like a really important advancement in camera technology. It basically is a pinhole camera that allows you to project an image from the outside onto a wall. Um, but in doing so, the image either gets inverted like upside down or it gets really blurry or really tiny. So in order to focus on this detail you're interested in, you really have to distort it and you have to leave a lot out. So I think of like your iPhone on portrait mode, you're like zooming in on something that you want to capture and making everything else the background. And to me, that's kind of what science has done with the female body. It's really focused on often the uterus and its ability to make a baby um, and its tendency to have diseases. And it's really blocked out a lot about sexuality, immunity, regeneration, and all this stuff that I was finding was super interesting and that even I had no idea was going on. Um, basically that these organs weren't just hanging around waiting to get pregnant. Uh, that has to do with the title, but mm -hmm. is there anything that you want to say about the illustrations? I, I, I don't think it's that common to have illustrations in a you know, straight ahead nonfiction science book. And, and the ones that you have are uniquely charming. They're not just anatomical diagrams. They're much more um, imaginative than that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, that was a collaboration with Armando Beve, um, who's an incredible artist who does like sci-fi novels as well. And so you can kind of see that influence. It's very fantastical. Um, so I, I'm really a structure nerd and I wanted this to be kind of a journey to the center of the body, um, going kind of organ by organ from in from outside to in. And so it kind of followed that we were going to be rethinking each of these organs and going on this fantastic journey. Um, and that's really what the cover's meant to represent. So we kind of turn a lot of symbols and tropes on their head. Um, the, the duck comes into play when we get into the weird and wonderful duck vagina anatomy. There's actually a flying clitoris in the background. That's a kind of an Easter egg that we call a clitoridactyl, but it's very active and it's just living its best life uprooted over there. There's a sperm dragonfly that's like dying in a pitcher plant. So we really wanted to kind of upset the common associations people have with these organs and this anatomy. And I'm, I'm really, really proud of how it came out. So um, in the beginning of the book, you, you make it clear that this was not just a historical exploration for you, that there was a personal resonance to it that sort of drew you toward the topic. Do you want to talk about that, about how it was that your life intersected with what, what came to be the subjects of the book? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I mean, I did put it in the intro against my mother's recommendations. Uh, so yeah, while I was at Smithsonian thinking about these issues, um, I myself got a vaginal infection that wouldn't go away. And that was really baffling to my doctors. Um, and, you know, I just hadn't dealt with this before. It was like itchy and uncomfortable and frustrating. And I tried all the remedies that a lot of women know. So there's like the plunger of doom, as I call it, which is like the monostat, um, yeast infection stuff, antibiotics. And finally, they realized that it was something called BV, which is a kind of an ecosystem shift in the vagina. Basically, it's a bacterial infection. And it actually affects one in three women before menopause, which is crazy. I'd never heard of it. Um, and it comes back again and again. And my gynecologist basically said, like, I'm sorry, it probably will come back. We don't really have any other options, but there is a last resort. It's something called boric acid and you put it up your vagina and it's essentially rat poison. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, obviously. Understandable. <laughs> but I've since learned a lot about boric acid um, and the vaginal microbiome. So thank you to her. Uh, so anyways, I was, I was doing that um, just to kind of like it's like comes in like a capsule, like an antibiotic, and it's like a suppository and you just lay on your back, put it in and like think about what you've done. Um, so uh, then one night I forgot to do it and it was really late. I'd just woken up at like 3 a.m. and I was in the bathroom and was holding it and I got confused and I swallowed it. Um, it I promise it's easy to do. Um, so yeah, basically I... I freaked out. And when I looked it up online, I would get like the poison control hotline and studies that said like a person died of boric acid ingestion. And I guess what I forgot to mention was it comes in this container that has a skull and crossbones and it says poison, mm. do not ingest, keep away from pets and children. Mm. Um, so 
basically I was extremely freaked out and did not know what was going to happen to me. Um, and at the same time, there was this real disconnect in me of like, you know, like I said, I'm someone who loves to talk about this stuff, who's really open, um, who maybe doesn't have much like shame around my body. And yet I didn't understand what I was doing, why I was putting this in my vagina, what it was doing to my body, why it could go in my vagina, but not in my throat. Like I didn't understand the science of this at all. And really neither did my doctor. She even said like, this was a last resort. Like we're not exactly sure how it works. Um, and for many people it doesn't. So I was kind of like coming back on myself and my own identity as someone who's like sciencey and nerdy and like went to Berkeley and took the femsex class and realizing like, actually I know very little about my body. And I imagine that millions of other people don't either thinking of anyone who has this or other infections. And as I would learn so many conditions that science knows nothing about. Um, so that was, that was like a turning point for me. Maybe things like crystallized a bit. Mm -hmm. So before I ask the next question, I just want to remind the folks who are watching us on all those various platforms that if you have questions, we would love to hear them. Um, you can put them in the comment boxes where you are watching. Um, it, this may be challenging on Twitter. If you reply to us on Twitter, I don't know if we will see it, but we will see them from Facebook and we will see them from YouTube. You can put them in the comment box and then I will recite them to Rachel when we get to the Q&A portion of the program, aside from the questions that I'm asking her. So, Rachel, we have been pretty lighthearted in this past 15 minutes or so, but, but one of the things that really struck me um, as I was reading through this history that you've reassembled is the degree to which it would be very justifiable to just be enraged all the time as a woman living in the world and looking at this this history of the ways that women were not taken seriously, were misrepresented, were the subject of a lack of curiosity. Um, and, and I wonder how you approach that. As, as you, how could you do justice to this material without just experiencing rage all the time, particularly at Sigmund Freud? Well, <laughs> I have opinions on him. Um, many people share. Yeah. It's, I think there's no way to do this research and not feel enraged. Like if you don't, you're not doing it right. And also at times like incredibly sad, especially for, um, so I profiled both like living women scientists and some historic ones that really made, had these transformative moments in their field and seeing like how they were shut out of science and how their careers were derailed and how like they couldn't reach their goals, even though they were insanely competent um, and that their lives sometimes like fell apart because of it. Um, like I, I really was very down about that. I felt very connected to and kind of obsessed with these women when I was going through their archives and doing that research. Um, it was important to me that this book be welcoming to pretty much anyone. I really wanted it to be a window in and something that, um, gave you a point of connection and that didn't like you, you know, like I got my feminist rage. Um, there are a lot of books that use that really well to talk about some of these issues. I wanted to use a different type of authority and evidence. I wanted to tell historical stories, uh, reconstruct them and show the journeys and the quests of scientists today who are trying to unlearn all this messed up history and reimagine these organs and, and give us some hope because things are changing. Um, so I, I did have the rage, but when I actually started writing or maybe when I started editing, I did try to, I mean, I don't, I don't use ideas like neutral and objective. Um, so I don't really believe in those, but I wanted it to feel like a story, hopefully that you wanted to follow and a mystery you wanted to solve rather than a rant that you wanted mm -hmm. to hate read. Um, so I hope that came out. I did, um, I think, outsource some rage to the footnotes and like people notice that there's a lot of very sarcastic footnotes. So that's one strategy. Um, and, you know, I had like angry conversations with people. Um, and I, I think like talking to anthropologists and historians who cover this material, like, you know, especially really dark moments, like the, the 
birth of American gynecology with J. Mar James Marion Sims, um, like they really knew how heavy and dark this was. And so to be able to connect and kind of understand each other and know this was the appropriate response was cathartic, helpful. So I think we should talk about that episode because I don't know how many people actually know about it, though it is more well known certainly in medical history and maybe in the academy than it was previously, not that it was ever hidden. And this is that J. Marion Sims, the considered the father of American gynecology, particularly gynecologic surgery, perfected his techniques on enslaved women, um, often subjecting them without anesthesia to multiple surgeries, right? Tell us, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, the horrible surgeries. Um, yeah, he was a Southern slaveholder, and basically his goal was to make sure these enslaved Black women were producing enough, like in their work, in their labor, and reproducing enough. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge that the roots of gynecology were about making women, certain women, into fertile, childbearing bodies. Um, and I really think that focus has continued. Um, also, that tendency to experiment and move forward um, on the backs of people who are vulnerable, captive, or cannot consent or fully consent came up again and again in the book. So that one is just so like obviously uh, kind of horrifying and skin crawling. Um, and I talked to an amazing historian who really looked into the women that were subjected to this and they actually knew more about these gynecological conditions than probably any doctor at the time. They served mm -hmm. as assistant nurses. Some of them may have gone on to be midwives and nurses for other enslaved women. Um, so kind of their story is really interesting and important that has been like left out. Um, but I was gonna say that besides this very obvious example of an ethical breach, um, when I looked at the history of IVF at the Free Women's Hospital in Boston, that also was sort of a charity hospital where women who could not afford treatment came in and they got treatment. And the other side of it was they were kind of used as experimental bodies. So their reproductive tissues, their eggs, their ovaries might be taken out and used for science that they didn't fully understand. Um, and there is a lot. So actually the hospital is based on the hospital that James Marion Sims founded in New York, which similarly had a lot of like Irish immigrants who were also experimented on. So there is a long history of this in gynecology. And I think knowing it has made some researchers much more careful. So people who are doing like vaginal microbiome transplants, which are really interesting, are super aware of this messed up history in gynecology and working to make sure that they have like the full consent, that people know exactly what they're getting into and have like access and transparency to these studies. So you, you mentioned when I asked you about this, that there are, there were so many stories within this history that you've written are women of women who were hidden, like the, the slaves belonging to J. Marion Sims, or women who didn't reach their full potential because of prejudice of the sexism against women at the time, and particularly against women in academic studies. And a story that you tell in the book that I had never heard is the story of Miriam Friedman Mencken, whose work, which is completely unheralded to this point, I think, really made IVF possible, right? Yeah, I mean, she basically did IVF in the sense of getting an egg and a sperm to get together and fuse outside the body in the 1940s during World War II. Like, and nobody knew that. Everyone says IVF started in the 70s. Um, and so she was the, the lab tech of John Rock, who everybody knows because he's behind birth control and he did a lot of work on IVF. But um, she was really his brains. And she really conducted all these experiments, which he was very aware of and actually gave her a lot of credit. Um, but her story, actually, I think I bumped into it at the Harvard Countway, like medicine history library. And there's a really big, um, archive of John Rock, but there was also a pretty big archive of Miriam Mencken that nobody really had gone into. There was like one or two articles on her, but everyone went straight for the rock stuff and nobody really went into her stuff. And when I looked into it, it was all of her lab notes. It was poems that she would write. It was letters about her divorce and she was just a really full person who 
yeah, as you said, like she kind of intersected with all these moments in medical history where there was a push to keep women out of the academy, um, to make sure they didn't get into Harvard. And because her husband actually was a pathologist who went through similar routes, you could really see that he sort of failed up continuously. And actually his continuous losing of his job was why her career was so derailed because she had to move around the country at every point trying to get eggs and sperm, trying to do this work that she was obsessed with and really the only person who could do it at this time. Um, but there were these factors that stopped her. She couldn't get her doctorate. She couldn't run her own lab. She always had to be part of someone else's team. Um, and she had to like, help her screw up of a husband basically like raise her kids and deal with like a really shitty marriage and divorce and then basically raise them herself so you could see so much untapped potential there she already did so much but like you can see that science and history would have been changed so deeply if these barriers weren't there I'm just going to remind the folks watching us once again that you can ask us questions if you want to. We, I have so many that I can go on for much longer than this hour, but this is your chance to put questions in the comment box if there's anything that you would like Rachel to address. So to move to something a little lighter for a minute? Yeah, why not? I'm all for a tone shift, as you can tell in the book. Chickens. I think we should talk about chickens, which as, as you know, we have a mutual interest because my last book was about chicken and chickens actually intersect with the, con with, with the story that you were telling, the larger story that you were telling in, I think in several ways. And I, I just, I love to hear about chickens. So I would like to hear about this. I, I know I did not think chickens were gonna come up, but then again, I didn't think Freud would come up so much and I didn't think ducks would show up. So what do you know when you write a book? Um, so, one of the craziest discoveries and kind of lines of thought that I ran into in this book were these researchers that study ovaries and have been saying for like 15 years now that human ovaries are not born with all the eggs they'll ever have. Actually, there's stem cells in them that are probably giving rise to new eggs throughout a person's life. And this work's ongoing and it's super controversial. So, you know, read the book. But what was interesting to me is that I try to look at these researchers who made like really out there claims and kind of came from a different direction and ask what was different about their background and their lens that allowed them to see what other people didn't. And in this case, there was a researcher named John Tilly who started in chicken ovarian biology. Um, and he had a very different background than most of his peers. Really, the chicken people and the human people don't talk to each other much. Um, but one thing that he and his uh, his co-researcher, Dory Woods, both knew was that if you have a chicken and you take out its ovary, um, and what was crazy that I didn't know also is it only has one ovary, the left, the right one disintegrates after birth. And then the left one is basically like this handful of yolks in all different stages of, like, of growth. Um, so it's like this big. And I guess that makes sense because you think of chicken eggs, right? Um, but if you take out that ovary, it will actually completely grow back, eggs and all, and sometimes it will even grow into a testes. So basically this ovary is super regenerative. It's making new eggs, it looks like, um, and it's kind of pluripotent or bipotent, like it isn't fated to produce testosterone and estrogen. It can do either. Um, so this was kind of a hint that the ovaries were more regenerative and doing more and maybe more dynamic than we thought. Um, but there'd been these really deep seated ideas that the female ovaries in women only degenerate. They only run out of eggs and by menopause they fail or they're exhausted. Um, so he basically was the only one who could, they were the only ones that could come in and say, wait, why do we think this? Maybe we should trace back that science and see like what was assumed and what the actual evidence is. Like, why don't we at least entertain the idea that ovaries make new eggs and do some research on that? Um, so it, it really got me thinking about how you can get very indoctrinated in the paradigm of your field and how you can end up very siloed in it um, and not even considering alternatives sometimes. So as I was writing my book, Big Chicken, which is about the rise of industrial scale agriculture told through the lens of chicken, um, I, I learned to slaughter chickens, among other things. And I remembered the first time I took apart a 
a just formerly living chicken. And the person who was showing me how to do this showed me all the eggs in, in the ovary, this, this chain like. of, of yeah. not quite um, matured yolks, because it's just yolks to start with, mm -hmm. that would slowly become in shelled eggs as they moved through the oviduct or would have if the chicken had continued to live, which sadly it was not. Um, he was, was explaining both the anatomy and also sort of the culinary promise of those because those un, un, hatched yolks are very precious to chefs who um, mm -hmm. cure them in salt and then like grate them in dishes and so forth and they're delicious. Um, but I, I, you know, as I was watching him take apart this ovary and, and display the contents to me and seeing all these yolks in different sizes going back what seemed into like the dawn of time, um, right. I could hear, you know, the, the sort of the, the gospel that you hear in sex ed class when you're in, I don't know what, sixth grade or something like that, or, or yeah whenever a sex ed class happens now, um, of, you know, first women have um, all the eggs they're ever going to have. And second, that one only ripens at a time and they only show up and then they disappear. And then the next one shows up and it disappears. And the fact that that another species could have them all present at once was yeah. fascinating and so challenging, as you say, to the dominant paradigm we have yeah. for how reproduction works. And I think it's not just like, oh, what a cool animal, fun fact. Um, like, yes, biologists love them because they can study eggs in every stage and they can follow them. But I think it usually gives insight into these conserved qualities in other animals. So um, in the human ovary, there's like a cohort of eggs that all try to mature and ripen every month. But usually one like beats them to the top and inhibits their growth until they all die. So it's actually like a very violent competitive process. There are many eggs growing at once. And it, it just feels very different from like, oh, there's a sperm competition. But in the eggs, it's just one little guy and the others just fade away. So. So because we're talking about how um, how paradigms can be challenged, what I'd really like to talk about next is really how um, a lot of your book is without necessarily intending to be, but just because it exists as it does, it is a challenge to the gender binary. And to th there's so much in it about how much male and female anatomy have in common. Um, and not just that the female is an, an, in, an inversion or a negative of the male, but actually that structures are shared. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get in a minute to how, how surgeons use those structures. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just love to hear you talk about this, the, the misunderstandings that existed of what actually composed female reproductive anatomy and how that's been discovered to be, those, those impressions have, have been revealed to be untrue. Yeah. Um... I think actually I could, the chickens are sort of a good starting point. Sure. I, I sort of briefly mentioned that an ovary can become a testes and can produce different hormones. Um, so definitely hormone science is a huge challenge to the binary idea. Um, it was once thought there were kind of female sex hormones and male sex hormones. And now we realize that ovaries are making estrogen and testosterone and a bunch of other stuff. And they can sort of turn from one into another but they're both like necessary in the female body and in all bodies. Um, but like in the female body, testosterone is really important to ovulation as well as brain health. Um, in the male body, estrogen is crucial to bone closure and growth and a whole other bunch of types of growth. So there's not some sort of dividing line. There's like, these are really, um, and Fausto Sterling um, has called these like growth hormones. So they really affect every body system. They're body wide. And there's all of this like interaction and overlap between bodies. And, you know, you can be a woman with higher testosterone than the average man, etc. So to get into the kind of anatomy, uh, what really helps me was to learn about how embryos form in the uterus. And Basically at six weeks, you've got the exact same structures. You've got like a genital tubercle, which is sort of a nub between your leg buds. Um, and you have two like sets of plumbing. Uh, you have what's known as the male, what's known as the female. And the old story is kind of, depending on whether you have testosterone and testes and a Y chromosome or an X or two Xs, um, you go on the male path and the female ducks wither away and you grow a testes and a penis actively. 
But if you don't have the Y chromosome, by default, the female will happen. She's like the factory settings on your iPhone. She's just like the basic default setting. Um, of course, makes sense, sure. Um, so it's, it's really only recently that biologists, actually feminist biologists have challenged this and said, is it that there are no factors leading to female development or is it that we haven't looked for them? And they found that there's all these active factors leading to ovarian development as well that we just don't know as much about. Um, but the similarity part that I wanted to mention is the penis and the clitoris are totally homologous. Um, so the tip of the clitoris, a lot of people still, I think, um, think that's the whole thing. And it's actually equivalent to just the head or the glands of the penis. So like, think about that ratio. 90% of the clitoris is beneath the surface. You can't see it. It's composed of like these bulbs that hug the vagina and these arms that kind of flare out into the pelvis. And it's a really significant amount of erectile tissue that comes out of all the same structures as the penis. So that embryo can really go either way and it's it's not that we all start out female and that female's default it's that we all have a shared body plan with the same materials that end up in slightly different configurations like not even that different i always think of it as like tacos and burritos like same ingredients different folding configuration um and the the other little fun fact is the plumbing i mentioned um that again it's like oh either the male goes away or the female goes away actually there are like tiny remnants of the male in female bodies and female and male bodies so there's like a proto uterus in the urethra of the penis that just stays there and is sort of this beautiful reminder of the shared anatomy we all have that's amazing it's a and thank you for describing that that's a fantastic um story and description of how alike these are yeah so I have many more questions for you, but questions are coming in from the listening audience. And so right. we're going to turn to some of those now. So let me choose which one I wanna ask first. Um, so to go back to some of the history we were talking about, about um, female anatomy and, and um, female reproduction not being well-researched. Uh, one of our commenters wants to know is, was this from the lack of female subjects being available for research, or was it more a question of stigma? Was, was it considered inappropriate or, or less promising for male researchers and physicians to research female conditions and female body parts? Absolutely both. So there's been a lot of cultural and religious taboos about researching the female body when you're a dude and like that was definitely the case in the time of hippocrates and he literally would say like i've never touched a female body i only know what midwives and women have told me um like like he's proud of that or something and yet he named the genitals the shame parts um but then even getting into like the golden age of anatomy in the 1500s there was exactly the problem that commenter mentioned so there was totally a lack of female bodies because they were relying on hanged corpses like people who were criminals apparently and um many of them most of them were men but they're like it's pretty clear if you read these anatomists arguing with each other that they didn't look at many female bodies and that they didn't they like they weren't doing their homework they were saying like, I discovered the clitoris. I think that it has a urinary function. And then someone else would say, there's no such thing as the clitoris. It only exists in hermaphrodites. Like healthy women don't have this. So there's definitely a different standard of research going on in the female body than the male. Um, I definitely see a, a taboo around looking at sexuality in female bodies specifically. Um, in this period, it was much, much more focused on reproduction. And that's maybe why the like clitoral cat fights got so heated and people were like insisting this doesn't exist. Um, so yeah, there were very different taboos in different times, but always female sexuality has been a touchy topic, often like a real threat and often thought of as sort of like a problem and something that needs to be solved, not something that needs to be explored with curiosity. So that's a, a, a great segue to ask a question from another um, person watching this who asks, was there a single thing in your research that you found out that particularly shocked you or that shifted the mindset that you had as you went into this to researching this book? 
I love that question. Um, I was shocked and schooled so many times that it is very difficult to pin down. But um, yeah, so I ended up doing the uterus chapter on endometriosis and sort of the evolution of the hysteria idea, which was the wandering womb in Greek times. Um, to kind of hysteria being all in your head, which resulted in masking a lot of chronic illnesses that really were stemming from the uterus. Um, and the kind of texts that I found from literally the 1990s and 2000s really shocked me. They literally define this as the career woman's disease that affected women who were white, anxious, and delayed marriage, and that it could be cured by childbirth. And I read articles by like, journalists who found women in like five years ago who were again told you really should think about having a baby like that could cure it when medicine knows that that doesn't work and is extremely sexist and crazy. Um, so the way endometriosis was treated and how kind of blatantly unscientific and so dismissive um, people were, people who had it, doctors were people who had it, uh, was wild and then to hear it discussed today as something that's incredibly complex unknown obscure and sort of mysterious and unknowable um it's been called the pelvic chameleon which inspired a chameleon illustration in the book um was like well duh you literally are using the wandering womb concept and you're telling people to get pregnant you're not actually asking what the biology is here and like you're not even looking at it until it's 10 years in and somebody has horrible symptoms and scar tissue everywhere. So of course it's mysterious now. You kind of made that assumption and surprise it turned out to be that. Because you mentioned that endometriosis was thought of as a sort of a, a striving middle-class career woman's, white woman's disease, I want to be sure that we take some time to talk about people who've been excluded from this history, and that's women of color, and also people who are not assigned female at birth. There, there are lovely stories in your book about the ways that new knowledge and reclaiming the knowledge of female reproductive anatomy is opening up vistas for people who are transgender or who are intersex, intersex that's hard to say, and also really empowering the researchers and physicians who are helping them. And I would love to hear you tell some of that story. Yeah. Um, so to mention um, what you said about women of color being excluded um, and trans people actually, uh, in that endometriosis chapter, those stereotypes actually led me to go talk to people who didn't fit those stereotypes um, that had really kind of narrowed who looked like an endo patient. And it was really clear that the farther you were away from this white feminine ideal of whatever, the more you slipped through the cracks of the system, the more doctors wouldn't recognize or suspect that you might have a reproductive issue. So um, a trans man that I talked to basically like couldn't get reproductive care, mm -hmm. could not get a hysterectomy when he wanted it, um, could not get insurance to cover these kind of things. There was just this kind of inability for medicine to move past like, well, you don't you're not a woman, you don't have women's health care, you must not have like these reproductive issues. So the people that are most harmed by these stereotypes are the ones who fall outside what doctors have deemed normal or healthy, which often has to do with power and the ruling class and who has the resources. Um, so as, as far as kind of the kind of really evolving science of transgender healthcare and medicine. Uh, I really loved looking into this because first of all, the change in attitudes um, in the surgeons and doctors who do like gender affirmation surgery has been crazy, like such a 180. It's been like, we will make like a hole for heterosexual intercourse and we will make you into a feminine woman who disappears into society and gets married to like, what are your goals? What do you want out of your body? What is your embodied experience? And kind of the surgeon Marcy Bowers I was talking to would always say like the clitoris is central. It, it's not an afterthought as surgeons often thought it was. Like pleasure and beauty are really integral to what we're going for here. And it's really crazy and coming from a very specific perspective to not consider that. Um, and what I also love about this is so, 
there is a way in which learning more about the vulva and vagina is really helping sharpen this surgery. But at the same time, um, the trans community and trans medicine is really making us have to realize like that we don't exactly know what vaginas are and what they do. And it's really pushing us to reconsider that. So if you're going to make a really like a really good vulva and vagina, you have to realize this is an organ that self lubricates, that has a microbiome of its own. So like its own separate ecosystem. Um, and it's like stretchy, muscular, powerful, and has these like intricate shapes of erectile tissue in it. Um, so like there are some really imaginative ways of getting to those ends, but they they make you realize that it's not just a hole or a tube um, as it's been demeaned as in the past. Um, and it's, it's also got like such a huge obvious benefit for the people who are who are going through this transition at this time um, and are able to kind of lay out their own destiny and what they're asking for in a way that's so different. Um, and yes, it also definitely reflects the ways in which, again, we're so much more similar than different. Um, the way that uh, male to female surgery works is because all of those structures in the penis are totally homologous and can be crafted into a clitoris and a vulva. Um, and surgeons know that, and Marcy Bowers, who's a trans woman herself and who was an OBGYN for 20 years, like really knows all the kind of parallels and homologies in this anatomy and how they fit together and are in no way opposites. The thing that I particularly love about Dr. Bowers' story, which he tells so beautifully in the last portion of the book, is that her insistence th that her patients who are receiving male to female surgery are um, are entitled to, to pleasure and delight. That as you say, they are not just as would have been, been, the goal would have been 20, 30 years before. They're not just getting their anatomy inverted so that there is a tube there, but that they are, are entitled to fully functioning genitals that will be a source of pleasure to them. And to me, that is, a, that is not only wonderful for those patients, and for the field of trans medicine, mm -hmm. but also that it, it, it gives a, a gift back to people who are assigned female at birth and stay there, that we too are entitled to claim pleasure and delight in our anatomy in a way that so much of history told us we were not actually um, entitled to do. So while I don't mean to suggest that the experience of trans people only exists in order to enrich people who are not trans, but that it is uh, it is kind of a gift that they are giving us at the same time to be able to oh. shift the narrative of, or to reframe, but really what all this anatomy is for. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, there was an anthropologist who would say to me, like, if you're crafting, if you're doing a rhinoplasty, you're doing a nose job, like, you know what a nose is. You're just kind of like shaping it into what you think is a good nose. But the first people doing vaginoplasties, they were kind of defining what a vagina is, what it's good for. And so really they force you to think about what we've taken for granted. Um, and again, that's why this reframe of like pleasure, delight, power, like these are kind of rights, human rights is a strong message for all bodies. <laughs> So we are getting close to the top of the hour and there's another question from the folks who are watching us that I want to ask you and then I'll come back and ask my last. So, um, so someone has asked us, um, if, if girls or your young women are reading your book, as we hope they do, um, what is the message that you would want them to take away? And equally, what, would, what message would, would you want to be conveyed to non-binary youth? Um, as I read all the histories you've put together. I love this question. Um, I did think a lot about sex ed and what I learned when I was, you know, a teen and preteen. And what I realized was a lot of the messaging that I got, and I, I think this will speak to a lot of people, um, is like this place of shame and fear, like you should not get pregnant, don't get an STD. And at some point you're going to get your period and it's going to be scary and mysterious and it might happen in class um and that was very unhelpful and did not exactly engender curiosity in my body um and what i hope that the book sparks like there's a lot of dark history and that is really necessary to understand 
but I really hoped to start from a place of curiosity and wonder about the organs in everyone's body. And what I hope a young girl or someone going through puberty um, would see is that these organs are incredibly dynamic and regenerative in ways that science hasn't really told you. And in some ways that it doesn't even know yet. And especially during puberty, like you're having these really intricate hormonal dances and these organs are changing and growing and being shaped. And that's exciting. Your body is a wonderland. Um, no, I think that's been canceled. We can't say that. But it's not a place of fear and shame that you shouldn't explore. Like it's your own Petri dish to really like get out the mirror um, and just have a different relationship to. Like that's, you kind of were asking how writing this book changed my own experience of my vagina and stuff. And you know, I realized I had a lot of baked in biases myself and I didn't think much about my uterus and ovaries, except like, I hope to thwart it from getting pregnant. Um, and now I do like, it's, it's subtle. It's not like I'm always thinking about my ovaries, but that they're like powerhouses supporting my entire body. And like, they do this without me asking constantly and go through this amazing dance every month. And my uterus is regenerating in this like incredible wild way that involves stem cells and immune cells. And it scarlessly heals every month again on its own. And my vagina is self lubricating and doing its thing and protecting me from the outside and being an extension of my immune system. Like, I just think there's such a different attitude and that's what I would really hope that younger people might come away with. So this is my last question. Um, out of all of the science that you learned about and the things that are happening right now and the research that's just getting launched, um, what are you most excited for? What is the thing that if you look a couple of years down the road, if you're not completely sick of this topic, and I hope you're not, what do you want? What what next story do you want to write about all of this? I'll never get sick of vaginas. And like, <laughs> penises are fine, too. They're just, you know, kind of overdone. Um Actually, I think there's a lot of cool science. I think vaginal microbiome science is really promising. So kind of the same as we did for the gut microbiome, um, having transplants that sort of like terraform this ecosystem and help people from getting all these recurrent infections. So like the one I got, but ones that are more serious and really interrupt your life. Um, I think that's gonna be huge. Um, there's a really cool project to use menstrual blood as a non-invasive way to test what's going on in the uterus. So like health, disease, fertility, basically like Theranos, but good um, and real. And so very exciting science. Um, what I am currently really, really interested in following is actually the intersex community and the work that they've been doing to get their rights fully recognized. So intersex kids for many, many years, for most of last century, um, when they were born, if they had genitals that didn't fit what doctors thought were male or female, because they were too big, too small, they would basically be like chopped up to fit the gender binary. And they would even have their reproductive organs taken out, their gonads, which had horrible consequences, um, physical, biological, but like really, like psychologically, the shaming. And we're seeing a really big change in how we treat kids and their their authority over their own body, their sexual autonomy, um, and their genitals and their right to pleasure that we've been talking about. And it's, it's still in flux and it still has a long way to go. But I think that, that movement is going to teach us all about these shared themes of like our right over our own bodies, not our right to fertility and reproduction and reproductive rights, but also our sexual rights and our rights to like author our own stories. Um, so I'm, I'm following that. That just sounds wonderful and I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much. I enjoyed this conversation enormously. Thank you all for watching. Um, that is it for this edition of the Health Storytelling Q&A author series. Please consider following Rachel on social media. You can see her handle there on the screen, Rachel E. Gross. And of course, go buy her book, which is available from her publisher, W.W. W. Norton. 
I'm sure it's available on IndieBound and Bookshop.org and Amazon and your local brick and mortar bookstore. Please don't forget to support them as well. And please join us next month on October 27th to hear Professor Jim Downs of Gettysburg College discuss Maladies of Empire, how colonialism, slavery, and war transformed medicine. And then again on November 29th, when Stephen Thrasher of Northwestern University will discuss the viral underclass. Until then, uh, I'm Marin McKenna on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University. And from me, thank you for watching. See you next month.